very much. Um, I teach at a place called the Canadian Forces College. It's part of the Royal Military College in Canada. We have a satellite campus that nobody really knows about in Toronto. It's a graduate school for senior military personnel and senior public servants. Uh, the idea is that for Canada, particularly these days, issues of national security are not just the responsibility of the military. So we bring public servants from foreign affairs, from uh, development, from CSIS, uh, from public safety, uh, to our classes so that they all study together so that as they move up higher in the public service, they know each other and can trust each other and have to work together. I, I teach courses there, one of them on how the Canadian government works, but more important for us today on Canadian international policy. And I thought I'd speak to you very briefly, brief being the key word I was told, uh, in, in an attempt to answer a fairly basic question. How has Canadian international policy under the current government changed, if it indeed has? And I will give you three slots of answers, or I'll answer it in three different ways. I'll answer it at the macro level, where I will say it actually hasn't changed. I will answer it at the micro level, uh, which I'll say it's changed unbelievably. And then I'll suggest a couple of implications for you, um, depending on on the angle that you look at. So the macro level, uh, and, and yes, some of this, some who are critical of this government might uh, find this uh, disconcerting, some who are terribly patriotic and they have their pride hurt, but I would suggest to you that at the, mic at the macro level, the, the Canada that we saw in 2006 is still basically the Canada that we see now. Let me give you some examples of what I mean. In defense, uh, we saw, until recently, a continuity of policy in Afghanistan, and I'd suggest that we continue to see profound similarities in the way that Canadian government send an underfunded and under-resourced military off wherever they feel like sending them. It's the same story we had under previous governments. In diplomacy, Canada continues to be broadly engaged throughout the world. All of the major diplomatic organizations that we were part of 10 years ago, we are still a part of. We still pay dues to all of them, and we still dramatically underfund our diplomats and don't treat them with nearly the respect that I think they deserve. That was true 10 years ago. It's still going true right now. In development or international development assistance, can you, Canada continues to promote what has been for decades an uneven, partly successful, approach to, to development and humanitarian aid that it is that it sustains through budget increases and decreases that are neither predictable nor reliable. That was the case under previous governments. That's still the case now. We've seen the aid budget go up, we've seen the aid budget go down. We've seen priority countries come, priority countries go. Priority programs appear, other ones disappear. That's not just unique to this current government at all. In trade uh, Canada has continued to emphasize the principles of free trade. We've been a free trading nation since the 1980s, and we have continued to cling completely illogically to a system of supply management in our dairy industry. So we say, and so which means we are free traders, and free traders until it's time for the dairy industry, where at some point we become supply managers, and that that is true for this government, it was true for the previous governments as well. In immigration, Canada has maintained a relatively open general policy towards immigrants. The number of immigrants that we are accepting either in quantity or by percentage of the population hasn't really changed over the last 10 to 15 years. And we continue to maintain, relative to the rest of the world, a fairly generous refugee policy. Not the most generous in the world, but not anywhere near the most restrictive in the world. On the environment, Canada continues to be all talk and no action. That was true under previous governments, it's uh, true under this government too. So if you put all that together, defense, diplomacy, development, trade, immigration, the environment, the broadest levels, really not very much has changed. You go micro, however, then everything has changed. Uh, so in defense, the talk, of defense has changed dramatically. Now we talk tough. Now we, instead of moving away from peacekeeping, which is, which is what the two previous governments did, now we basically disparage it. Now the contribution 
relative to the Martin government is no different, but the attitude is significantly different. Um, in diplomacy, we no longer have the same level of tact that we might have had 10 years ago, and probably less regard for certain relationships. The current government, I would suggest, privileges the quality of relationships over the quantity of relationships. So certain relationships are extraordinarily important to it, but others are not, and when they are not important, the government pays significantly less attention. It's a, different at the, a difference at the micro level as well. In development, we used to have a separate Canadian International Development Agency. Now we don't. It's been subsumed under the new Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade, and Development. So micro level, there's change. Um, in immigration, our rules have been tightened at every level, and if they haven't yet, they will be soon. And that seems to reflect, and with our refugee policy as well, a government that is significantly less trusting of non-Canadians. So at that micro level, in terms of specific details, there are some changes there as well. On the environment, the big difference now, I would suggest, is this government isn't ashamed of not doing anything, whereas previous governments lied about it. <laughs> the outcome is the same, but the current government is almost proud of not doing very much. So what are the implications then? Part three, part last, what I'm saying. What are the implications for these relatively micro-level changes in the strategic context? Uh, I'm not going to come to a conclusion. I'm going to give you three conclusions. You can pick the one you prefer. Um, so one argument is that at the strategic level, the implications are, are basically nil. You shouldn't expect to hear about foreign policy in the next election because nothing has really changed. And the differences from the part between the parties aren't great enough at the, in the grand scheme of things to create a real wedge issue here, and Canada's influence in the world isn't important enough to put this at the top of anyone's priorities. So one argument is, yes, why should I care? I'm not sure. Second argument from conservative partisans would be that what you've seen over the last 10 years is a Canada that finally has guts, courage, and a little bit of brute strength. That, extra, that expresses itself honestly on the world stage, that is clearer in its positions, and that takes firm stances. The current government calls it principled, but that's kind of what the other governments call it too, so I won't use their <laughs> lingo. And then the third view, supported by opposition partisans, is that Canada has fallen apart, that our reputation for, for surety and impartiality has been squandered, that Canada has lost influence, in the world, although how anybody measures this influence is still a, a little bit beyond me. So implications, either there aren't any, Canada has changed for the better, or Canada has fallen apart. Pick your choice, there's evidence to back up all three, and I'll leave the decision to you.